Welcome back everyone. It's time to see some more results. We'll check out the difference between run one with the 40 pound weights and run two with the 20 pound weights, as well as something that we'll just say is interesting. So let's get to it. Hit the intro. First thing you may have noticed, I've got a green screen. Don't worry, I'm not going to go green screen crazy. I'm pretty new to this, so I'm still trying to feel it out. But let's get back to the Cavendish. I want to show a side-by-side -side comparison of both of these runs, so that you can tell the difference between the 40-pound and the 20-pound and the results they produced. So, here's three examples of the first run. I did a total of 10. But you're also probably going to want an overhead shot to see what's actually happening inside the box. Oh, what's in the box? Damn it, Brad. I'm sorry. He promised he wouldn't be interrupting anymore. Next, we need two from the second run. Now, I only ran five runs of the second run. I'm running out of time, as everybody knows. And behind me is an example of the overhead from that run. As we watch this, you're going to notice some arrows pop up. Red arrows indicate the extreme prior to the M2 being introduced. After the M2 is introduced, you'll see green arrows showing the new extreme. This original video is 25 minutes in length, but I've compressed it down for brevity purposes. Now, I'm going to get out of your way so that you can see the action. I'll check back in a few minutes. Enjoy the royalty-free music. You can see on the top run for the 40 pound weights that the smallest deviation observed was six millimeters. This particular run was the smallest of any of the deviations. Every other run was at least six millimeters or more, but you can see they're all generally the same size. Now for the second series on the bottom run with the 20 pound weights, you'll see that the largest deviation was four millimeters. And that particular run is the largest of all the deviations for series two. Everything else was smaller than that. Now, if you compare the results, a drop in approximately 50% of weight for the M2 resulted in approximately a drop of 50% of deviation. Cavendish confirmed. Now for something a little special. One of the explanations for what the cause of these results could be has been magnetism. A lot of flat earthers will claim that the only reason that Cavendish works is because of magnetic attraction between the two metals which is the reason why I picked two non-ferrous metals. Non-ferrous meaning the metal doesn't generate its own magnetic field. So for this part of the experiment, I got two giant magnets. Each of these magnets individually is capable of picking up 1,400 pounds. That's a lot of force. So much force that if you accidentally let these two magnets get together, uh, you have to 
do some building to get them apart. So if the original theory holds true, with the introduction of these two magnets into the box... What's in the box? Damn it, Brad! Well, the only observed effect that we should see is due to the gravitational pull of the mass of these two magnets, not due to the magnetic fields. So, let's take a look. Interesting. Maybe it's an anomaly. Let's try it again. Um, give me just one minute. Uh, I have to talk to a few people. Jared. Jared, dude. The magnets had an effect. That doesn't help! Craig. Oh, oh, Craig. He's a smart guy. Hey man, I introduced the magnets, and they appear to have caused an effect in the Cavendish device. There goes my drinking money for this weekend. AB Science. AB Science is a smart guy. He knows what he's talking about. Hey man, I need you to take a look at my results. Something happened with the magnets. I think I understand. But then what caused the effect I observed? He says to take a look at this video and maybe you'll understand. Hopefully I do too. You might not think of water as being magnetic, but it is. And so are graphite, aluminum, and glass. This is a new and different category of magnetism called either para or diamagnetism, and it's different from the magnetism that you're used to. You're probably already familiar with ferromagnetism. Ferro means iron. An unmagnetized piece of iron or nickel or cobalt becomes a magnet in the presence of a magnetic field. The effect is strong and lasts even after the magnet is removed. Paramagnetism is a similar effect, except that it's much weaker and temporary. Aluminum is a good example of a paramagnet. Diamagnetic materials are exactly the opposite of paramagnetic. They are always repulsed. They would rather die than be in a magnetic field. An important example of a diamagnetic material is graphite. This specially made pyrolytic graphite is repelled by a magnetic field. Don't be confused. This is not static electricity or eddy currents. 
Graphite is repelled by a magnet, always, both by the north and south end. After a little research and some reading and talking to some people smarter than I, I think I understand it. The issue that we have is, everything is magnetic. Everything, technically, will interact with a magnetic field. But, not everything is a ferromagnet, meaning that it will generate its own field. Your refrigerator is magnetic, but it does not generate its own field. The skin of your refrigerator will allow a magnet to stick to it, but two refrigerators will not stick to each other. Similar to how two nails, when touched to each other, won't stick, but you can magnetize one of them with a powerful magnet. The weights that I use for the experiment are non-ferrous metals. Lead is diamagnetic, meaning that when it interacts with a magnetic field, it will push away from that field. Cast iron is paramagnetic, meaning that it will attract to a magnetic field. Now, cast iron can be magnetized temporarily through electricity or by allowing it to interact with a very strong magnetic field, but both of those magnetic properties do dissipate. Thankfully, before I ran this experiment, I tested all my equipment with an EMF meter. So the metals I'm using do not generate their own magnetic field, but they will interact with an active magnetic field, such as that introduced by giant magnets. So what happened while I introduced the magnet into the system, as it interacted with the diamagnetism of the lead, the lead pushed away from it. But what that means is that everything in phase three of my experiment was a little pointless. Because what I observed is exactly what science says would happen. When I introduced a strong magnetic field to a diamagnet, that diamagnet pushed away. So, the entire run of series three had no purpose other than to be. Well, how did Jaron put it? Interesting. Yeah, but I guess there is one perk. I did get two giant magnets out of the deal. So, stick around for the Cavendish Teardown next week. Thanks for stopping by.